Hello, I'm Elizabeth Nolf McDonald. I'm a communication coach, and welcome to The Verbal Edge. I'm going to ask you some questions. Do you delight in and respect the power of words? Now, anyone who knows me knows this is probably going to be a topic today. Or do you seldom even think about words? Or do you become exasperated when people misuse them? Or do you fall back on your filler words that have maybe become meaningless knee-jerk expressions? Well, if you fit into any of those categories, this show is for you. Uh, I listen meticulously to how people speak and the words they use, and I am fascinated by words. And I believe that's because I was a television journalist. I also was in communications and marketing. I also was an English teacher at Southside. And I also come from a family who loves words. And as I said in a previous program, my uncle uh, was an author of a grammar book for college. So words are our life. When I thought of who could be a guest who would personify that, the first person I thought of was Betty Stein. Betty Stein, you are a former Fort Wayne Community School teacher and also a recent recipient of the Tapestry Award, and you uh, personify to me English, speaking, and lifelong learning. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. We knew we have known each other through Fort Wayne Community a Schools. Long time. Yes. And I the first thing I want to say, because people are saying, okay, this is about words. Uh, Betty is a you are a columnist for the, uh, the News Sentinel, right. which we're gonna talk in fact I have uh -huh. I have received this from so many people on your columns on words. People give that to me. It's their gift to me. Anything dealing with words and I over and over get your columns, and I thought, this woman, I know this woman yeah. anyway. I didn't know we shared that passion, and we do. Uh, you became a teacher later in life. Let's oh. talk about your teaching first. All right. I was well into my 40s. Uh, one child was going off to college, one was in high school, and I thought, I'd better start thinking again in a nice disciplined fashion. So I went out to St. Francis to see about getting a master's degree. And Sister Fridian said, it's fine, but why don't you get certified to teach while you're doing this? And I looked at her and she said, you've raised two children. They've turned out well. Why not? And I thought, why not? I certainly would love to try it to see if I could be as good as some of the excellent teachers my children had. Mm -hmm and better than some of the others. And so I became a teacher, and the day I was certified, there was an opening, and it was wonderful. Went into the classroom, and I'm still at a school. I'm still at Memorial Park one day a week. You went into a school, which is? I went to Fairfield Junior That's High. unusual, because I had to substitute for two years before I finally became a full-time teacher. So you- That is the way. Well, I mm -hmm. was very fortunate. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, yes, I was certified on a Friday, and on Monday I was in a classroom. And you didn't particularly want to teach middle school, did you? I wanted high school. Mm -hmm. I wanted thinking students, of course. But uh, once I was at junior high, I called downtown and said, please don't take me out. I'd like to stay here. I found the age fascinating. Uh -huh. And why is that? Uh, these are people who are old enough to think but they're young enough to let you know how they feel. Oh, yes. And that's important. So from Fairfield Junior High, you went where? I went to Memorial Park Middle School when the magnet program began back in... 69, 68? Uh, 79 was oh, when 79. Memorial Park okay. opened up. Yes, All right. that's when they put the program in. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been there ever since. And in between there, you've retired. I retired <laughs> and was told, come back as a consultant, and I loved the idea. So I, I've been there writing the newsletter, working with youngsters one-on-one, -on -one, uh, editing a, a literary book of their writing, of our youngsters' writing, arranging special programs, just having a perfect time. When I think of you, I think of everything you are involved in focuses on communication and words because you not only are involved at Memorial Park still, but you are also the president of the library's building <laughs> fund. Is it 
building, building corporation. Building corporation. You're also on the uh, Friends of the Library. Good for you. Okay, thanks. Yes. And you are here at the library, and you were telling me that you had not seen this area yet. Just, absolutely. I thought I had toured the whole building. Mm -hmm. I had missed this completely, so I'm delighted in more ways than one. Thank you very much. You're, you're very welcome. And tell me about the articles that you write for the New Sentinel. Uh, I have two columns. I one that's every Saturday night in the feature section. It is on what someone is currently reading, his or her favorites, uh, all to do with books. And the other column appears on the editorial page, usually twice a month. And it's whatever I want it to be about. It can be books, it can be spring, it can be words, mm -hmm. um, anything at all. So while other women your age might be in Florida fully retired, you are thinking of a column and writing a column and going to Memorial Park once a week and interacting with those middle school, those vi vibrant, vivacious middle schoolers. What a life. It is. I've really, I've been so blessed, Elizabeth. It's just, it's a great life. And why go to Florida? Well, yes. You know, there's so much to do here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have raised two children, as you said. Now, let's go into words. How did you, uh, do they like words? Do they like communication? Did they catch your passion? And if so, how did they do that? The answers are yes, yes, and yes. Okay. Um, they love words. I remember one of them had a guest for dinner, brought a guest in to dinner one night, and, and he was so shocked because we were sitting there talking about intransitive verbs. But everybody was very bothered and talking about intransitive verbs, and he wanted to know how many dinner conversations we had like that. But there's just a fascination with words, uh, I think partly because they were read to or because they loved books and fell in love with them. Mm -hmm. uh, television was just coming into mm -hmm. its own. Mm -hmm. And there was so much to hear and respond to, or to read and respond to. And, and um, well, I felt very sorry for them because they grew up, my mother was a grammarian. My father loved words. And my poor children didn't have much of a choice. <laughs> I grew up with that same mom, and I am so thankful. You have been around middle school children for quite a few years now. How has education, English and literature education, changed from when you began to right now? There was um, a concentration for an unfortunate while on let's, and what else is there to say except dumb down? Let's not teach them the classics. Let's let them have books that are written in their own language and their own experiences. And so that was a stylish thing to do. Um, don't teach them grammar. Let them express themselves. And I remember the day a consultant came in and stood in the back of my classroom. In those days, we had consultants. Mm -hmm. And the English consultant stood in the back of the room, and when the kids left, came up to me and looked at the chalkboard and said, we don't teach diagramming anymore, Miss Stein. We want children to express themselves without criticism. And I said, maybe you don't, but I do. I want them to express themselves correctly. And we continued with diagramming. And we very quickly went back to Romeo and Juliet and some of the so-called classics. And uh, kids surprised me. If, if I had an honors class that was doing Romeo and Juliet, some of the other students in other classes would ask, why can't we do them? And the answer is, you certainly may, let's. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Once the opportunity was there, they jumped at it. And you did it in the Shakespearean language and not in the contemporary English. It was Shakespeare. Yes, I did that too with my students, just so they could hear the beautiful language. Yes. One quick story. Yes. I also had them memorize. Um, they had to do so many lines of sonnet or whatever. And I remember Doug, who was so unhappy that he had to memorize, but he picked the, the balcony scene. And when he was a senior in high school, he came back, he walked in my door and said, Miss Stein, I've got to thank you. 
You know, I learned those lines from the balcony scene, and I use them on <laughs> chicks all the time, and they work. So you see, there are more benefits than just uh, feeling good. That's right. Who would have <laughs> known? What delights you about words? What delights me about words? How nuances can creep into a conversation. How they can be used dangerously sometimes, mm -hmm. as in propaganda. Um, how they can make you feel good when you're using imagery. There's so many different reasons for loving them. Can you think of a metaphor or a simile that is one of your favorites, speaking of imagery, from any kind of a book? Anything, does anything come to mind that when you read it you thought, oh my, this would have been very stale without the metaphor or the simile? Um, the Highwayman, the poem, The Road Was a Ribbon of Moonlight. And I remember thinking about the alliteration, the road, ribbon, but I could see the road going down the hillside. And then, of course, there were the cliches of they became like um, as red as a rose. Mm -hmm. But they do create pictures. They weren't cliches to begin with. Right. They were so. I remember from teaching uh, Maya Angelou's book, you, I, the name. And Cage Bird. Case, yes, Cage Bird sings. What always brought tears to my eyes is when they talked about her uncle who was crippled, but when this couple came to the store, for some reason he didn't want to show that he was crippled, and then when they left, he walked back to his cane, and he did it by, on either side, uh, the aisle, he, he held uh, the shelves on either side of the aisle, walking back to his cane, and she said it was like walking out of a dream. <sighs> Powerful. Yes, this metaphors. very. We talked about what delights you about words now. What exasperates you about um, some usage of words? And then we can just talk for five hours, right? It's sometimes the carelessness, the, the repetition, and so needlessly. Um, and it happens on television so often in an interview. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with me? Exactly. Um, did you read uh, that particular recipe? Is it two teaspoons of sugar? Exactly. The snow fell and uh, I think it was over four inches. Exactly. Words like exactly, my goodness. Precisely, or that's right. I'm so tired of exactly. exactly. Please one of don't those, use it. It's one of those knee-jerk words that people just use and not think. And you wrote an entire article in the New Sentinel about that. Yes, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and that began. Didn't it begin? Oh, your my, readers? yes. I began to hear from people. Yes, and they sent in their favorite unwords or unfavorite words. It was cathartic, I think, for the writers. Oh, they were so glad to be able to express themselves. And honestly, I think it's helped some people do away with some loathsome and repetitious words. Well, we were talking to um, Matt, who's doing the audio, and he said he reads your columns. So it's widely read and appreciated. Well, I'm so pleased. I'm, I'm delighted. Yes. I hope my editors are listening. I'm sure they are. 